It's Crucible Radio's guide to getting good. Hey, boys. Hey, birds. Boys, 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 boys. Swain, boys. Boys. Birds? Bones. Swain. Boys. I called you a Quain earlier tonight. Quain? Uh, not on purpose the first time. And then, because I was going to ask you a question. And I, I was thinking about it. <laughs> Guys, we don't have time for this kind of nonsense. We need to get right into it. Get into what? I felt like as if we needed to have nonsense that was also evergreen, along okay. with the advice that's evergreen. Uh, non sequitur, talking over each other. Uh, Sarcasm. So yeah, sarcasm, sarcasm. Someone uh, saying, well, outrage. well, well, well. Yeah, repeat a word three times, and we all repeat the word three times. And then we all argue over the pronunciation of niche. Niche. They're just, it, it could be any word, right? Truly evergreen. Uh, okay, enough of that nonsense. We have got to get into this because we've got a lot to cover. This is Crucible Radio's evergreen guide to getting good. Week one. Week one at <laughs> video games and uh, Destiny in particular, and also maybe first persons in general, maybe also life in general. A little bit of life, a little bit of life. Whoa. Bit of life. Boys. Boys. So boys, I wanted to start this off. Um, so we're going to be playing some uh, some of our favorite uh, clips from 200, 200 Would You Believe It episodes, uh, our favorite interviews. Bear uh, with us if they just feel jarring and they just appear after we talk. <laughs> We'll have a little jingle. We'll have, um... Are they going to play that jingle from the top <laughs> after each no, one? No, it's just going to be like a little, like, Teddy Ruxpin, like, couple bells or something, so you know that we're cutting. <laughs> Look, we we started off this game uh, all liking video games, but probably not as good at video games as we are now. Actually, I know, Swain, you and I are better. Bones, you might have... You might have stayed... You, you, you may just have an, an innate talent that goes in and out of practice. <laughs> But uh, some of us got to work for this shit, man. And so I, uh, I Those are old, you, too. Yeah, right. It's not getting any better. <laughs> we had our wits about us. So, hey, I wanted to open this up by saying, you know, we've talked to a lot of people. We spend a lot of time free associating on the topic of video games. Um, and you'll hear from some of them tonight. But for you guys, what would you say was the number one thing? Maybe a piece of advice or something where you just felt like, Light bulb went off. Okay, I didn't have it before. I've got it now. I have the tools to get better at video games. What was that? My favorite stuff was always Keen coming on. And uh, every time he talked about the game, it, it like kind of jogged a new thing into my head. I was like, oh, mm-hmm. that makes sense now. Like moving the cover. That was a big one. Um, playing for your life. Those types of things. And and the all around, the one of the things that drew me to the playbook in general was his uh, uh, scrub mentality write-ups. So I give yes. Keen a lot of credit towards my improvement. Keen is one of those people where you, you talk to him about video games and then you're like, oh, I remember. There's a lot going on here that I'm just not even thinking about. I, I totally forgot all that stuff existed. But actually, no, it's... It's there. There's oh, yeah. always for, something you should be remembering me, to do right now. Video games have always been a relaxing. Let's put down all the thoughts from the day and just kind of zone out and do the thing. Um, and first, at, at, at first, that was wasn't as enjoyable. So getting better at the game was what made those uh, made that easier to kind of zone out and enjoy things better. I feel like I had a few big, big moments where I got over a plateau or reached a new level, you know, broke into a new tier as a player had, had and had figured something out, you know, multiple light bulb moments while playing Destiny for four years now. And some of them happened in, you know, Destiny 2 year one and maybe even some more recently. But I, I remember a few of the big ones, there was always you know, when I finally figured out how to play aggressive, what that meant, it didn't mean charging in with a shotgun, uh, out of cover. Uh, it meant pushing in when you have an advantage. Uh, I remember when I fell in love with being the last guardian standing in trials and realized like, Hey, there's no reason to give up, like play until you can't. 
and try to make something happen. And I just kept doing that and doing that. And it felt great. Uh, I definitely remember looking at the game from a different perspective, almost zooming out of the first person and seeing it like a chessboard, like a big map that you can strategize around. And that was from Fizzer way back in the day, mm. talking about yep. spawns, talking about, you know, strong points on the map, where to control versus just sprint, full sprint back and forth with no, without a clue where you're going, just looking for your radar to ping red. And I really remember, you know, watching his videos, talking to him on this show, just like how he could play the game, barely moving his character, but knowing where other people were. And it became less about putting myself in the heat of the fight and being in the right spot and more about where is everyone else going to be? And I'll just position around them. That, that was my moment, I think. Yeah, Fizz is another one of those people who hearing him talk, you just, uh, yeah, he just realized there's a lot going on. If you can find Fizzer, and, and there'll be some D1 videos, just like watch him with the team and everyone with their Midas and just hear him doing live commentary and realizing like, yeah, he, he just had it locked down. Like they just don't stand a chance at this point. Yeah. I think for me, the moment that probably sticks with me are, I guess, yeah, for you, it's, you know, it's a series of sort of light bulbs. But I remember the first time I ever won a rumble. Um, mm. It was on Exodus Blue, and I just remember, like, just how, like, my heart was racing. And I remember just thinking, like, because, like, when I first got into Crucible, right, it was stressful. I, I, you know, I'd never played in this kind of format before. The idea that it was, like, other people and just, you know, being bad. And it's like, oh, my God, he came out of nowhere. I died so fast and and kind of getting stressed out by it. And then getting over that, like, and, you know. Play quick play, whatever, you know, play your control. And then going into Rumble and being like, wow, there's not, you can't rest in this game mode. You really have to be in it. Um, and I think I had some sort of fizzer thoughts in my head. I remember, um, I remember, uh, Bonzi, what was that map that we were going to do the whole show about? Cauldron. <laughs> Cauldron. Yeah, I remember a physio, Fizzer video watching him play uh, a rumble on Cauldron with Thorn and just stay on that bridge heavy the whole time, just cleaning up kills and realizing like, yeah, you don't have to do laps around the map. You just have to time it right and be in a better starting position and thinking like, wow, I'm so just, yeah, like I, for someone who's never like good at sports or never quite understood that kind of adrenaline competition thing to go like, wow, it works. It works. I can do this. And even though I'm like feeling nervous or intense or whatever, like I can still keep my head on and pull this out. Um, yeah, just is, is was proof for me. It's like, okay, I can be as good as I want to be and as hard as I want to work in this game. And that's the limit, right? And you don't have to push past that, but uh, yeah, I'm capable of it. I can do it. So looking back over all the previous episodes that we recorded, we've gotten a lot of advice over the years. And to me, it seemed like it kind of broke out into these two different categories. We've got all the mechanical stuff, and there's lots of mechanical stuff. This is how to move around, how to snipe, uh, you know, how to play with your team, what's a good call out, all those goodies. Uh, but then there's this thing, that, I mean, it's kind of a crucible radio-y thing, uh, where we we talk about the other side of it, just sort of the the business of getting your head in the game, and you know, call it sort of the the athlete mentality side of it, or the uh, the patience and focus, or the mindset side of it. But this is the kind of stuff that we we really figured out over the course of the show, and we had a lot of good help with. And so that's what this episode is going to cover. We're going to get deep into the mechanics next week. Don't you worry about that. But this one. Uh, we thought it was a nice little uh, recap of the sort of good advice we'd learned to you know, deal with stuff like tilt, right? Deal <laughs> with uh, stuff like warm-ups, you know. Because we never have those problems now. Yeah, we're fixed. We are better. <laughs> we, we, excellent brains that we've got, and they Incredible work real minds. good. All right, so this uh, this first section coming up here, I mean, Bonesy, we, we kind of got to start with, uh, with the Sports Psych Steve clip, right? Of course. I mean, this is the guy that shook us out of our our stupor and made us realize that there's more to just learning the best guns and what the perks do. I mean, this was like, this was our start, our dive into a new way to approach competition and, and growth. So it's perfect. 
Look, if you don't know sports psych Steve, go back and, uh, well, go back and listen to him talk. He's a professional sports psychologist. He works with professional athletes, with the military. Um, you know, this is the real stuff. Going all the way back to episode 33, uh, this is our good friend, sports psych Steve, talking about, I think, one of the most fundamental things we've ever covered on this show, kind of the basis for everything else. He's talking about the growth mindset. So the two mindsets that I was referring to, there's the growth and the fixed mindset. And this comes from uh, a book that was written, the name of the book, coincidentally, is Mindset. So you can take a look at that. It's pretty easy to remember at this point. But um, the growth mindset and the fixed mindset, as I mentioned, it, it impacts progression towards mastery. And it's how you view different ca different categories or different traits. And so when it comes to things, I'll, I'll go through all five of them. The first one is how failure is viewed. So people that fall into this fixed mindset view failure as reoccurring and something that they they don't have much control over and that there's nothing that can be gained from it. Whereas somebody with a growth mindset is is able to look at failure and see, hey, look, I can I can improve in these specific areas. This is temporary. Um, I'll be able to to get over these failures. And that's just one of the characteristics of how having a different mindset can approach, you know, your level of frustration or your level of enjoyment for a specific activity. And there are four more of those areas as well. Let's hear number two. <laughs> so the next one. <laughs> so so the next area is obstacles and and dealing with um, uncomfortable situations. So those people that are in that fixed mindset tend to avoid obstacles and challenges and those uncomfortable situations. Whereas people that have that growth mindset, they embrace obstacles. They embrace putting themselves in uncomfortable situations and overcoming that. So I've noticed with obstacles, there's there's some pretty typical ones you can run into. I know for me, one of the things that can spook me for sure is going up against a really good sniper, just like one of those psychic snipers who just guesses every time you come around a corner. But the more I play, the more I realize that there's obstacles that might not even involve the enemy team. One thing is who's on my team. I mean, Iron Banner is one of those times where you're playing with a lot of people. You're always trying to find six, and sometimes you might be in a party with people that you've never played before. And... There's just some people I don't gel with. You know, we have different styles or we're, we're on a different pace or we have different strategies. And it's one thing to say like, okay, this guy isn't psychic. He can't snipe me around every corner. I can get around this. It can be very frustrating when it's on my team and this is somebody I can talk to and I've got to try and find a way to, to work around that obstacle or try and improve that or accept it what it for what it is and, and play my best in spite of it it's almost easier to deal with the other team than it is to deal with communication challenges with my own group. Yeah. I, I'm not really sure what else to say, but that, that is absolutely true. If you, if you can embrace that, you're in good shape. <laughs> Mute and party chat works really well. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> That's why you're never responding. To me. <laughs> that or I've muted myself accidentally and have not realized yet. I was wondering why no Damn one, man. no one's listening to my hey, call outs. Listen. 3,000 hours into this game, and that still happens on a daily basis. <laughs> All the time. You wouldn't believe it. Like, both, Birds, is your mic muted? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, yeah, I was just talking to... No, it's, it's about... two minutes later because we're in the middle of the round, and I can't take my hand off the controller long enough to flip the mute <laughs> back. <laughs> Anyways. Or you, you're like me, and so, you have one of the cheap Xbox One headsets, and I'm already on my third one after having the thing for like a year and a <laughs> half. <laughs> Those things are such garbage. <sighs> So it Sorry. goes. All right. So obstacles, challenges, and how you view mm -hmm. those. That's number two. What's number three? Number three is how effort's seen. So those with the fixed mindset see basically putting in effort as worthless. Um, no matter how much effort I put into trying to improve on my ability to snipe or however much effort I put into trying to improve my KD ratio, it's not going to matter. Whereas those with the growth mindset see effort as worthwhile. And even if it's incremental, small improvements, they feel like they have control over the outcome by putting in additional effort. I like that one. I'm going to be telling that to people all the time. <laughs> fixed mindset, bro. <laughs> effort works. Fall out of that fixed mindset. <laughs> so the fourth one is, is how feedback's accepted. So those, those 
players, gamers, whatever it is that fall into the fixed mindset with this, they are very reluctant to receive any kind of feedback and they see constructive criticism as just criticism and it's in a you know a personal attack on on their abilities. Those with the growth mindset though are very open to feedback and they listen, they learn from feedback, they're they're able to take constructive criticism and internalize it, understand that it's not an attack on who they are, but it's somebody that's reaching out trying to provide you some guidance to help you. And so those with the growth mindset are much more open and accepting of that feedback. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> Cause I, I, we, a little like personal anecdote here, me and Bones were doing a trials run over the weekend. And I distinctly remember texting Bones while we were doing it. I mean, like, Hey, what am I doing wrong? Cause we kept running into all this, like, you know, the sweatiest teams ever. Every problem in the book. Yeah, pretty much every problem you can, you can think of. We ran into it. And we were just texting back and forth, like, uh, you know, trying to figure out what we could do better, you know, planning for the next match. Like, you know, I want that constructive criticism. I want to know, you know, what did I mess up this time? You know, I ran in a little bit too quick or we're not working cohesively on getting to the middle of the map. And it's, it's just so nice. <laughs> it's so much more effective than like, dude, what are you, come on. Oh. You know, like that, like, I understand people get frustrated, but. But when it's directed at someone else on your team, it's just, you're done. You're falling apart. You lose. <laughs> there's well, <laughs> there's no recovering from that. You also got to be willing to be like, hey, I wasn't good that time. <laughs> what can I do that's better this time? What what do you think will I do this, but this time that could improve our chances? Yeah, and these things don't um, happen in isolation, Swain. So I like with what your example was, it was really interesting because it addressed several of the things that we just talked about, right? So you talked about how you had one match where you didn't perform all that well. So, you know, what you would consider failure, but you saw that as something that you could change. And we talked about effort. So you talked about if I put in some effort, I'll be able to improve my outcome. And you talked about reaching out for feedback and being able to receive that feedback and being able to implement it. So you see how these things kind of work together if you are more in that growth mindset as opposed to the fixed mindset for that specific task. One thing I've sort of realized, not so much in Destiny, but really just in my job and my my sort of personal life is that sometimes it's easy to sort of guess what kind of mindset a person has. And it really doesn't do anyone any favors to sort of just make up in your mind, oh, this person doesn't want to hear from me. They're going to get angry if they hear from me. I know I've learned to just sort of say, at least the very first time, at least say, hey, hey, look, would you maybe be interested in a little completely unsolicited advice and give them a chance to say no and then if they say yes, really, really give them a chance to give them something small and honest. And I can't tell you how many times I've been surprised where I was just sure I was going to get shut down. And instead the person goes, oh, yeah, I guess I see that. That's really helpful. Thank you. And all of a sudden I realize, hey, this is someone who's on the wave. Like this is someone I could communicate with. But I just had to sort of carefully test the waters that first time. Yeah, I think it depends on what kind of feedback you're giving to Bird. So if you have a relationship with somebody you know, that you've been playing with for a while, maybe they're more open to some of the, the improvement type of feedback. So here's what you could do to get better. Um, but you also can provide feedback of what somebody's doing right and the strengths that they have and let them know what those strengths are and how they complement your play style or your game type as well. So the last one is the success of others and how you view success of others. So those with the fixed mindset, are they feel threatened by the success of others and they don't put themselves in situations where others are going to be more successful than they are. However, the those that fall into the, the growth mindset, they don't feel threatened by, by other success. In fact, they get inspired by it and they learn from other success and they're fine with putting themselves in challenging situations so that they can learn from others and and again, going back to like if they fail that one time, it's something that's temporary. It's something that's changeable. They have control over it. They put in effort and they can overcome it. So you can see how these all kind of work together, but it's going to have a significant impact on playing the game and how frustrated or or how much enjoyment you get out of the game and whether or not you get better at it or not. And that's so huge, too, for those trying to push into that competitive world and we, we've talked in the past about how it's tough to get into scrimmages and sweats and it feels like it's this group for the elite, but putting yourself out there and, and saying, yeah, let's do it. You can shoot my head 8,000 times this game. I want to learn. I want to see what you did to be better than me. 
and watching people go into those scrimmages for the first time, or maybe they've only done it casually for fun and then really try to take it seriously. It's really cool because there is tons of stuff to learn from someone beating you. You can watch exactly what they did and you have the unique ability to say, I know exactly what this person is thinking. This person being you, I know exactly what was going through my head at this time. Why did I lose in that interaction? What did they do differently? Yeah, that's the perfect environment, Bones, that you're talking about with those scrims or sweaties or whatever you want to call them now. But but that's the environment where you could really see the fixed or growth mindset coming out. Somebody that's going to avoid those is somebody that's in the fixed mindset because they, they have the feeling that there's going to be other people that are better than them and they don't want to challenge themselves. They'd rather... You know, go back to non-skill based, uh, you know, competitive matchmaking, not to bring up a sore subject or anything, but they just want to pub stomp on people. Right. They never want to get better. Yeah. They just want to beat up on, you know, scrubby noobs and, and Christmas noobs and, and everybody else that's out there. That's a lower light level than them. That is that great start, that good jumping off point right there. But the natural progression leads us into the other side of video games and how we think about them. <laughs> I do do you think that like this kind of this kind of mentality exists outside of the gaming world <laughs> or is this specifically a gaming thing? I think what we learned is that we can be scrubs in all walks of life. But this is this uh is born out of uh the video gaming world and just happens to be certainly applicable to sports, athletics, uh business your job, everything. But, you know, there are scrubs everywhere and scrub mentality is a real problem that a lot of people have to, you know, they struggle to get over it. Sure. And Keen, Keen breaks it down. From uh, episode 53, our friend Keen Koala. Ooh, yeah. Love that one. You know, receiving feedback and adapting it is, uh, is, is figuring out your mentality going into playing. And you broke down a book called playing to win by David Serlin, which Mm -hmm. many people know as a, uh, a video game book that discusses uh, uh, fighting games and the actual meta and the competitive elements of fighting games. But you applied that one to destiny as well. And that one stuck out with me so much on your first post. I want to talk about uh, introducing the scrub because that's easily my favorite post on the playbook and it should be required reading for anyone who wants to get better at the crucible. I think it's probably my favorite thing that I've ever written, like, period. I had so (laughs) much fun writing this article and conveying a tone that is uh, pure sass. (laughs) <laughs> I, don't, I would say I don't that think, is pretty accurate. I don't think yeah. I could I could ever recreate this. Uh, I, I I don't think I'll ever be in the right mindset to recreate this because there's just <laughs> a perfect storm of events happening on the playbook at the time. Um, but yeah, it's a it's basically a, a fighting game community uh, article on uh, a mindset for a scrub, which by Sarlin's definition is a scrub is a player who is handicapped by self imposed rules that the game knows nothing about. A scrub does not play to win. Uh, so the key, the key phrase in his definition is handicapped by self-imposed rules. And you see this everywhere. And with I can kind of pl- relate to it because before I started getting into the crucible, I was a scrub. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. And, but like, I, okay. I, this is a safe it. place, Wayne. I would I mean, I would I would give my friends shit for using Thorn. And I was just kind of like that gun is like too good. Why are you using it? Like, why are you being one of those guys? Yeah. It's, it's a moral superiority complex. Basically the scrub (laughs) just has a moral superiority complex. It's like, Hey, you know, I'm not using thorn. Uh, and I beat you therefore, and I deserve to beat you because I'm not using thorn. But when you beat use thorn, you don't deserve to beat me because you you're cheap. You're using something that's unfair or it's leveraged against me or, or whatever excuse that you want to come with that the game doesn't care about. That gets disguised in so many ways too. You know, it's one thing to say, uh, I, I don't use thorn because of my morals, uh, which is one, a stupid sentence, but uh, <laughs> two, not how it's always phrased. I mean, I see people reacting to passion notes saying uh, that takes no skill, which is one, a stupid thing to say. And two, it just, it doesn't matter because you know, it's just your way of saying, oh, you use a more effective tool than me, yet I expect to have just as much success against said tool. You know, so there's In fact, just I deserve the success. Exactly. I should have had it had you not cheated and used yeah. that gun. That had you, you not made a decision that I'm capable of making, 
myself, uh, I would have won had you put yourself at some other random and arbitrary disadvantage. So there's there's a lot of ways to to apply this mentality without even maybe realizing it yourself. And and that all comes with what are you really placing the blame on your decisions that you made or what another player did? Well, the the best uh, example of this as a disguised um, being a disguised scrub is actually the mindset that you're playing for to have fun, but you get mm-hmm. upset when you lose. And so that is a that is like the the definition that I'm going for here for a scrub, because if the point of the the if the goal and the ultimate end game of what you're doing is winning, then anything you're not you're doing that doesn't get you to that point, uh, it's inefficient. It doesn't matter. Like you should be doing if if the point is for you to win, then you should be doing whatever it takes to win, outside of cheating. Um, cheating is always outside of. Uh, outside of a scrub mentality. Uh, it's, it does have, it has nothing to do with playing to win. It has everything to do with just pure manipulation. Um, Mm -hmm. but the idea that you want to have fun, but you still want to win, you can't get upset when you lose and you're having, and you're trying to have fun because in, in a playing for fun mindset, uh, the whole point is to enjoy yourself, to enjoy the time you're spending. But when you suddenly get upset because you're trying to enjoy the time you're spending, but you're losing, then really your whole goal was never to have fun. Your goal, whole goal was always to win, but to have fun while doing it. And those are two things can be at odds with each other, which a lot of people struggle with that. Like winning isn't always fun, but it can't always be fun winning. So I think one thing that I've struggled with is, you know, you, you, I play video games for fun. I like them because they're fun, but I also want to play well. And there's times where I sit down and I'm just not in a good headspace. Um, I mean, over the years, we've talked to people who, who take it serious, who have a little warm-up routine. We've got a little, uh, got a little thing to get them centered. Uh, and I guess I kind of, I guess I kind of warm up. I don't just jump right into comp and want to know my warm up immediately get angry. I do actually. I was going to ask. Okay, it's play one game, be really bad, realize my wrists are super tight and have to stretch, mm-hmm. and then I mm-hmm. stretch after. So I really need to fix the the order of how those two things happen. <laughs> That's good. As long, yeah, you get one in and you realize it's time to do it. Nice little reminder. Anyways, we've uh, we've talked to a couple of people about this, but I think uh, I think we go back to the source for this one from I believe his very first appearance back before we made him king. Uh, this is from our friend Doctor Lupo. This is episode thirty four. I know, I know. It makes you sad. That's you, not what I but- signed up for. <laughs> <laughs> That mindset you talk about, I, give me some advice. I mean, as fans of the show know, I'm traveling for work all the time, and I'll go a stretch where I can't play Destiny for a week. I come back, and it's like I'm kind of going through the motions. It kind of feels right, but I can't get to that place in my head where it's just, you know, I'm, I'm completely in the moment, and I'm just thinking in terms of the narrative of who's doing what, what do I need to do, yeah. what has to happen. If you're feeling kind of far away from that, how do you get there so you're ready to, you know, finish out a lighthouse trip? It's kind of like going through a, a tune-up process with a car, we'll say. You know, they they do your 14-point checkup when you bring your car in and they charge you way too much for it every single time, but you keep going to the same place cuz you're lazy. Wait, what? Am I talking about myself? No. Oddly specific <laughs> metaphor. It's strange, right? Please, go on. <laughs> so when I, if, if I have a day, and this, this happens especially at the beginning of each day on the weekend when we're about to start doing trials, I'll do warm-up games, and I have a checklist that I go through mentally um, that maybe I think about, maybe I don't think about, maybe it's just subconscious, but things like, okay, am I remembering, first off, that I have Shade Step? Okay, I, I do, in fact, have Shade Step. <laughs> Am I using shade step appropriately at corners, you know, post snipe? If I'm trying to have a snipe out, am I snipe and then immediately shade stepping? Am I shade stepping over reses? Uh, or if I know I'm being ads do I shade step to drop the aim assist from ADS? That kind of thing. I'll do those kind of, am I doing, you know, am I, am I running the correct thought process? That is some good advice from Lupo, and you're welcome for giving you the Crucible Radio bump. Look, we, we take some credit for it, whatever. Uh, but, you know, what goes hand in hand with those mechanics. <laughs> had nothing to do, sorry, had nothing to do with him, like, religiously streaming. Being a great guy. Huge audience, networking, everybody nice. loves them. Yeah, mentally uh, it, it, above it was, all the internet bullshit, whatever. 
we pull the strings and we don't have any sort of complex about it. We're not weird about it at all. We love him. He loves us. He loves us. <laughs> he loves us. We're so great. But those are excellent mechanics. That's how you start getting in the zone for, your, for the game you're about to play. But what do you do if you're, you know, shaking off a long day or you're not in the right mental state? There's all these sorts of ways you can sit down and be ready. You got to get into the flow. And there's a few ways to do that. And Steve, once again, has some good advice for that from episode 58. Because this is not a one-stop thing where you're going to do it once and you're going to be great at it. So hearing that you're still (laughs) working on your grounding exercises and your imagery and your breathing and all the things that we've talked about in the past, you're setting the right example for your viewers. So good job with that. Dude, I I just got married. I had to stand in front of everyone I know and (laughs) recite a speech. You better believe I was counting three things I could smell right before that happened. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, hopefully you were very mindful and in the moment in your wedding. Congratulations again on that. Thanks, man. But what can you do in order to get better and bring in some of these sports psychology specific techniques into to gaming? The thing that I wanted to talk to you about today was creating an effective pre-performance routine. And so from the sport realm, uh, you see pre-performance routines pretty much in every sport. So what is a um, a racer before he goes up to a track meet? Um, what is he doing before he gets in the blocks, right? Pre-performance routine. Or what is a wrestler or a boxer doing before they get into a ring? Pre-performance routine. Uh, same thing with a baseball player, right? Before he walks up to the uh, to take his at-bat and he goes into you know the on-deck circle, he's going through his pre-performance routine. And so you can apply pre-performance routine also to your games in Destiny. So um, before I even get into how to create a really good pre-performance routine. I'm curious if either of you guys or any of the three of you guys have routines that you do prior to games. Um, Well, I usually flick around on my phone and find (laughs) something on Reddit to look at. So there's that. I stretch my forearms a lot. Um, I I started getting into the weird habit that I've, it's it's definitely weird because I've, I've absorbed it from watching other people play, but it's, uh, rolling my thumbs around the thumbsticks like repeatedly um you'll see like you'll see certain streamers do it and you'll you'll see the, like the whole camera move in a circle and it's something that I started doing and actually started helping like I don't know if it's a placebo effect but like loosening up and being able to get into like back get my thumbs back where I need them is uh something I do usually I guess that's the the part I struggle with right like you know, you talk about a batter being on deck. Okay, well, he's going to swing a bat. Like, that's a that's a physical thing. We're going to, like, click our fingers around and wiggle our thumbs. How do you get in the zone for that to happen? So what I typically work with on, whether I'm working with a, a professional gamer or whether I'm working with a soldier before one of their performances or even an athlete, um, it's a three-step process for the routines. So it starts with a release period. Um, And then it goes into a planning. And then finally, the third stage is a trigger. And so what those three stages look like for each person is going to be looking a little bit differently. But I can give you an example um, if we'll stick with the, the baseball example. So let's say the inning ends and you're the catcher. You have to release yourself from the responsibilities of catching, calling the game. You need to get into the dugout and you need to be a hitter now. And so wiping off the sweat, taking off your equipment, putting on your batting gloves, things like that are all releasing yourself from the previous inning. Maybe there was a bad pitch that was called. Maybe there was an error, et cetera. But you're releasing from that. Then you're stepping into the on-deck circle and you're starting to plan your at-bat. So what is the pitch that you're looking for? Um, potentially if there's a guy on base, you're looking at your third base coach, getting some signs. And then finally, there's a a point where the release is over. You've already planned for what you want to do. And now it's time to actually perform. So there's a trigger. So maybe it's something that you say to yourself. We've talked about self-talk in the past. Um, Maybe it's a specific focal point that you look at. There's a lot of different things that you can do, but essentially you want to trigger yourself to say my mind and my body is ready for the upcoming performance, which in the baseball example would be the pitch coming and you hit the ball. So, I mean, the way you describe it, it seems like that could all happen in, you know, in, in, in a couple seconds. Is this something that takes 10 seconds or is this something that, you know, is a five minute process? 
Well, that's, again, up to the individual and how much time that they have, right? So if we're talking about in between actual games in Destiny, that could be a bit more of a complex routine. So you may have one or two steps that's part of your release, uh, maybe a, a thing or two, maybe some imagery involved in your planning, or maybe you're talking to your teammates and you're coming up with another strategy for the upcoming map. And then your trigger may be something that's very quick. Um, but you could also incorporate these pre-performance routines in between rounds in a trials match as well. Obviously a lot less time, only about 15 seconds. So you'd have to abbreviate that, still make it useful for you. So something like releasing versus something like planning is releasing generally a physical thing and planning is a mental thing are they both mental how does that work like do i do i do stuff <laughs> <laughs> that's good yeah that's a good question so the release essentially is there so that anything that happened in the past remember when we talked about mindfulness we don't want to get stuck in the past right we want to be mindful of the particular moment that we are required to perform. So the release is anything that you can do to release from whatever just happened. So it could be some of the breathing, like the strategies that we've talked about with the deep breathing. Um, maybe it's a, uh, you know, getting up and, and doing a quick stretch or like what Swain was talking about with actually moving his thumbs around. Maybe that's all the release that you need. The plan again is what is it that you're planning on doing for the upcoming performance? All right, folks. Well, I hope you are enjoying this episode. Um, I think it is pure honey gold harvested from the highest mountaintops. Um, and I hope you're enjoying it too. But we need to pause and uh, give thanks for a moment because this show is made possible with the help of our sponsors. And this week, our sponsor is HelloFresh. HelloFresh. Look, HelloFresh makes conquering the kitchen a reality with deliciously simple recipes and fresh pre-measured ingredients delivered to your door. All meals come together in 30 minutes max. Call for less than two pots and pans and require minimal cleanup. See, that's... Swain, I feel like you appreciate that kind of thing, right? Like when oh, you're yeah. new to cooking, like you're making a mess, you're giving every pot and pan dirty. They're getting you started off right. Just follow the steps. Plus, with three plans to choose from, including classic, veggie, and family, there's something for everyone. Get out of that recipe rut and start cooking outside your comfort zone. That's that's really it, right? Y you make a dish for the first time and it turns out well because you've got the actual right ingredients. You didn't get like the wrong kind of parsley or something. Even as a chef, I love HelloFresh because it's like having your own personal sous chef that grabs all the stuff for you. <laughs> so nice. gives, It sets you up and you are just ready to go uh, as soon as you sit down, sit down with all these ingredients. See, for me, I can't, I have a lot of trouble following recipes. You just put mayo in everything? Yeah, well, I put on things that where it calls for it. That's not the <laughs> point. The thing is, is that once I've made a recipe once well, I know I can make it from that point. I remember how it goes, and HelloFresh is just cutting out what is normally the first three times I make something where I go, okay, that was good, but some notes for next time. No, they're going to set you up. You're going to make a delicious meal from the start. It's a, it's a good system, like... It's a really good system. So for $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash Crucible80 and enter the code C-R-U-C-I-B-L-E-8-0. That's HelloFresh.com slash Crucible80 and enter the code Crucible80 for $20 off your first four boxes. Okay, so now you're all, you're ready. You've got your, your fundamentals down. You know what you're supposed to be thinking about. You're getting into that flow state. You've stretched your wrists. Uh, you're, you're feeling loose and you're good. You're not going to tilt. But then you got to start thinking about the game itself, right? It's no longer about you and you got to look at the game you're about to play. And one thing that really clicked for me over the, the years of recording this was when I started looking at the Crucible from a top-down perspective. Who's doing what, where they are, where are they showing up? And it became clear when I realized it was like a chess game. And there are cer certain players that, that view the game like this and do an incredible job of just knowing everything that's going on. Uh, two of those players that you're about to hear from are exceptionally good at staying super, super level-headed and smart and can describe their most complex thoughts while also clicking heads in incredible fashion. Uh, the first one up is Ninja with no L, who to this day is absolutely slaying in Destiny 2. 
And this little bit is from his appearance on episode 56. You know, what are some of the elements of being a, a surprising or unpredictable or, or sneaky ninja type player? I think uh, some of the biggest aspects that people don't expect are the mind games part of like PvP. Um, most people just contribute something like gun skill being the only thing that matters. But once you get, I guess you could say, decent with your thumbs in regards to aiming and moving, it starts to embark on like a journey for thinking about how you're going to approach the situation and also thinking about what they're going to do. And if you can kind of expect what they're going to do, you can change your gameplay up and make them play on your terms. And that's the beautiful thing about PvP. It's this ever-changing experience where you could technically have control in some of the weirdest scenarios. <laughs> how would you say uh, if you had to, if someone were asking you while you were playing, how do you transition from, okay, I've got my gun skill down and now I have to start thinking more? I mean, because that's sort of a weird, vague ambiguous step to a lot of players, but we're always saying like, ah, it's a mental game and all that. So how do you get into that mindset? I think once you start getting a really good comfort level with whatever loadout you're trying to run, you start to to not really focus on necessarily aiming precisely. You just get in this rhythm of, I know I need to aim. I know I need to shoot at this time. And if you get in a very good rhythm, you can eventually just do it without even thinking about it. And that's when you start evolving into the, the aspect of now I know I can do this automated task Mm -hmm. Now I can start absorbing these new variables on how an opponent's going to play, how I think they're going to play based on past, I guess you could say, lives lived in that match. Or if you even remember the guy from an old game that you played him in before, even earlier in the day, there's a lot of, I guess you could say, remembering that goes on to mm -hmm. understanding certain players. And there are players out there that you will see in the Crucible that you're like, I remember this guy. He was really hyper aggressive with a shotgun in Twilight Garrison. I know that I can kind of bait him into a doorway and I can get the advantage. So basing your experiences off of past games is really going to help you. Is that something you find yourself doing? Let's say you've just loaded into a salvage match and, you know, you got this, the, the selection. You got, you got a hunter, a warlock, and a titan. Do you find yourself kind of building stories about each of these people to help you in your engagements against them? I would say for, the, I guess you say the under average players, you don't necessarily do that as much because you kind of have this understanding how they're going to behave without really thinking about it. It doesn't seem like it's very complex. Sometimes it can be, but you can kind of deal with them with ease. But once you start approaching players who are, you know, average that are getting kills on you on occasion, or those players that are very proficient, like some of the top tier players, that's when that comes into mind. That's where you start building this framework of past experience and knowing what they're going to do based on some previous, I guess you could say lives, like I've said earlier, um, individuals that play really hyper aggressive, individuals who bait, individuals who like to retreat when they're weak, and understanding that and kind of building on that is the important part. Um, overall, I guess you can just, you're going to focus more on the upper end of the spectrum because that's where the real mind games start to happen. Uh, that 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 ninja with Noel uh, episode. That's a good one. He's very, uh, you know, we talked a lot about the meta at the time, but the way that he approaches it, kind of very methodical. I think is. Uh, it's a good one. Go check that one out. Um, but if you really want to go back to the archives, you're going to have to go back to episode four for this one. Wow. Um, this was uh, this was our chat with Invicta, and he had just put out this montage from the first Cauldron Trials, where he's just basically directly above people in that middle <laughs> room with the shotgun. Just blink up, go down and shoot. Blink up, go down and shoot. And it was, uh, it was a good montage, but it was just very inspirational. I think for me, that was kind of realizing like, how do you just like, how do you process it all? How do you get your brain thinking that fast? And um, I don't think there's a silver silver bullet except uh, to to do it. But he had, uh, he had some good insight into kind of how these mind games work. How do you stay on top of all that and turn it around? Um. Well, I like to start by saying I've had a lot of practice in rumble um, with a shotgun. So I, I, it's what I used to play all day, every day as a uh, as a titan. Actually, um, I was like top ten rumble as a bubble titan. But uh, wow, uh, a few months ago when I went to the hunter and started using blink, I realized it's all just a giant mind game, and you can play very fast before. Um, I play on a 10 sensitivity, so mm -hmm. everybody's Oof. still trying to turn around and get their bearings on me while I've had a lot of practice staring at that radar and uh, getting everybody's like location on the map um, down in my head and recognizing like, hey, since I blinked from here to here, 
they've had about time uh, they've had time to take about two steps so they're basically in the same spot they're right there boom got them <laughs> well so when you're when you're in that close i mean are you able to rely on the radar i mean is it all just kind of a blur or are you just pivoting and just watching those pings swing around as you move um yes both basically <laughs> yes. uh, <laughs> okay yeah I'll sometimes it. it's a blur and i am struggling to uh get my orientation back basically but uh oftentimes i i still am looking at the radar the whole time i'm blinking make sure they didn't make a jump around somewhere else themselves and uh it's i try to maintain speed in everything i do because it keeps my my brain thinking that fast to uh um, basically if i slow down i won't have as much coordination doing this myself um i don't know it keeps a fast tempo on everything you know when we were looking back over uh all these previous episodes and kind of looking at the guests, you know, like the thing is, Bonesy, like for us to do like 10 episodes or whatever, like what well, we're on 196, 186 was like, yeah, it was nothing, right? It was like a couple months ago or whatever, <laughs> yeah. right? And it felt very different at the beginning of the show, you know, in our first, you know, our, going from our first episode to our second, our third, our fourth, to our seventh episode, um, it just felt like things snowballed so quickly. And uh, this, for me, I think is is just fundamentally always going to be a high point of the show. We this was from episode fifteen, which meant we had been doing this show for just over three months, and uh, we talked to none other than Chris Cluey. Bonesy, who is Chris Cluey? Chris Cluey is the is a former NFL punter. He played for the Minnesota Vikings, and uh, he was a very talented punter. Had some incredible stats. And an all around really cool guy because it turns out he's a big nerd and he knows it and he's been into the the nerd world for a very long time, even throughout his career. So it was like this natural thing where I realized, oh, of course he knows what we're talking about on this show. And I see that he's playing Destiny. So I'll hit him up. And he weirdly responded to me and I panicked. <laughs> and I went, oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, we got him to come on the show. But it was so cool to discuss uh, you know, just going into a competitive arena from from the perspective of someone who's literally been on the largest stage and had that pressure and knows how to perform uh, under all that pressure. I mean, imagine 53,000 or whatever people just looking down, hoping hoping you make this punt and don't kick it out of bounds. I mean, if you can go through that, you've got some good tips. <laughs> well, and, and actually, that that's one of the things, too, is that um, from playing in the NFL, it's you need to be able to put aside a bad game and recognize, okay, that game sucked. I did horrible. <laughs> <laughs> like, I had a .75 KD ratio. Okay, I, I'm going I to can. forget about it. I'm going to approach the next game like it's a brand new game, and I'm going to do my best. And then, you know, more often than not, you, you'll actually do a lot better if you're able to put that previous game out from your mind. But if you dwell on it, well, then you're screwed. <laughs> That's probably why I'm able to handle it so well. I'm a Philadelphia Eagles fan, so <laughs> I deal well with disappointment. Yeah, how, how's Chip working out for you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> focus, Wayne, focus. Yeah. Try and bring it in, bring it in. Well, so, you know, tilt is something that we've talked a lot about on this show, but in a sense, it's universal, but there is a question of scale here that I think you've experienced in a way that none of us have. I mean, we've all been in clutch trial situations. We've all had last minute victories that we've pulled out, but especially considering your role as a punter, I mean, I cannot imagine what the pressure is like where it comes down to a single moment where you need to execute and you've got thousands and thousands of fans all watching you. I mean, the struggle is universal, but there has to be something that you're tapping into that lets you focus on the thing you actually have to execute instead of all that's going around you. I mean, how do you get to that place and, and perform at that level? Um, you, you just have to learn to focus solely on what the immediate task is and tune everything else out. And that's one of the things that kind of puts professional athletes apart from those who could have been professional athletes but never made mm -hmm. it is that the professional athlete knows how to tune everything else out. And it's it's almost zen-like in that you need to be f immediately focused on what is in front of you. 
and nothing else matters. Like the, when when I was punting, the only thing that mattered was okay. I'm going to catch the ball. I'm going to make sure the drop is in the position I need, and then I'm going to perform my motion exactly how I practice. Like the people rushing, the people watching, the TV cameras. None of that mattered at all because it didn't. You know. In the end, it, it didn't affect my job. The only thing that affected my job was how I could perform, you know, when I had the ball in my hands. And so I think that that's the key thing is, is learning how to tune everything else out and just have that focus to where you know what you're doing and you're, you're in the moment. And if you can do that, then you become, you know, so much better at what it is that you want to do. Like I've had crucible matches where I like, I can feel like I'm in the zone. Like, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, I know there's going to be a guy coming around this corner and I'm going to shoot right at this time. And boom, I got him headshot. He's down. Like, I know that someone's going to be going for this control point and I'm going to throw a grenade and right as they run through the archway, the grenade goes off and they're down like stuff like that, where, where you're just, you're focusing on nothing else but where you are right there and it, it's it's really hard to do but once you get in that zone it, it feels so good <laughs> uh something that chloe I, and and uh, that, that was that was not the end of our our chats with chloe you actually talked to chloe on uh gaming and hell that was a good chat yeah that was really funny because uh my my co-host dan was the one that sort of reached out again and then i had to be like hey remember me <laughs> and he was like oh shit yeah uh, but yeah, we talked about, uh, you know, his time in the NFL, the, the experiences he had on and off the field and that sort of thing. And, and plus his take on some, some current games and, and the industry, he's, just, he's just a really, really fun, super nice guy who, who looks out for others. And he's got a lot of, he's got a lot of good advice coming from, uh, the life that he's lived. It's, it's inspiring and I like him a lot. And it was really nice that we could just chill and, and talk. I mean, I think uh, I think for me, getting to speak to people who are not, you know, just exclusively destiny experts, but really have performed at a high level, is uh, it's educational, right? It's a whole other world, mm -hmm. uh, and that's what this uh, this next chat is. Um, he actually just came up the other day because he is crushing it on the Apex Legends side. Um, but before that, he was a longtime Halo player, Destiny player, and actually a, a proper esports coach. Um, this is our conversation with Brood from episode 77 talking about kind of kind of what that tourney scene is like when you're really uh, you're really playing at the top of the heat. So you mentioned uh, coaching and that stood out to me right there because uh, that's, you know, people have talked about that in Destiny, but we're not at that level of professionalism and schedules and stuff like that. What does a video game team coach do? I'm really curious about that. I, I'm glad you asked that. I, I think it's all of like the... Here I got your Red Bull. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're basically the butler of the team. No, no. It's, um, it's a lot of the mental game. I mean, like golf, like any sport that you play, there's a whole mental side of it. And that's where whenever I join a team, I think the top 1% of players, they all have similar gun skill, but it's really a chess game, mm -hmm. uh, managing special time, managing like how far a team could be into their supers, what supers they have in halo. It was managing when rockets and snipers come up is making sure that everybody heard the call outs that needed to be heard. Um, but that's what I bring to the table when I played, uh, in the last tournament, I, I think that I compete at a high level, but I think that I pride myself on the chess game and in game management, whether it be mental or your in-game attitude, keeping that positive vibe going, picking up your teammates when it's needed. All that stuff adds up. And having a good coach can make a difference uh, from winning a tournament to placing third in Halo. And I, I like to think that we all have like a coach on our team now, but it's it's really a, a team effort. That well, that's you mentioned the the buzzword that I love is saying chess game when talking about Destiny. <laughs> that's my favorite way to play this game. So that's really interesting. Uh so, well, in Destiny, we don't have coaches, so to speak, and it's more, uh, it's still that homegrown vibe. So what I notice from these tournaments is that they are long stretches of day. I mean, it is wake up earlier than maybe you would have woken up on a Saturday, start playing and finished by dinner time. What's the process there for eight hours of Destiny? How are you guys staying together as a team? What are you talking about in between matches? How do you handle downtime? How do you survive for that long? Yeah. Um, it, it's tough. 
it's tough, especially if you're coming off downtime and you're going to play a team that's gone through two rounds previously. So they're hot. They've played a few uh, competitive mm-hmm. matches. Um, I mean, you'll see you'll see a lot of the top tier players when they're off stream, just uh, getting ready, playing some rumbles. Just keep it casual. Keep keep it relaxed. Um, my team, we actually just take like mental breaks. We'll go do 20 push ups, grab some mm-hmm. water, literally tell each other to breathe because you might get <laughs> you might get so tense that that, I don't know, things are moving too fast in your head and you have to learn how to pace yourself, right? It's a marathon. It's not It's not a sprint. I really loved that brood chat because I remember that was right after the bubble tourney. That was a big yeah. moment where people were not happy that this bubble <laughs> strategy was was smoking people and that the storm callers were getting their supers and just pushing out with overshield. Oh boy, that was, that was some exciting times where this was, you know, deep into the meta and suddenly a new strategy arises. I love when that happens. I think we're going to have to pull that defender meta, that bubble, that bubble tourney clip for uh, next week's episode. Uh, but coming up with this next one, um, this is, you know, how people kind of get in the zone, how they focus when it's all going on is, uh, you know, it's a personal thing. We all kind of figure out what works for us. Uh, but one of the treats in talking with uh, our good buddy, sports psych Steve, is that he's got, he just has a lot of exercises. He's got a lot of practical things you can do that are, uh, that are going to work for everybody. Um, And this was, uh, this was one of the very first we learned about. Uh, So this is um, from episode 33, our friend sports psych, Steve talking about the three by three. So the exercise is a three by three grounding exercise to get you back in the moment. And it's a really simple, quick thing that you can do. So I'll walk you through the exercise. And if one of you guys wants to do it, feel free to let me know and I can walk you through it. Let's do it. All right. Let's, can we Maybe all do you it? Said it. <laughs> well, if you all talk at the same time, it's going to be kind of weird. Okay. So Swain's the guinea pig. Swain can do it. And then you guys can kind of like do it in your head. That sounds dirty. <laughs> mm. <laughs> all right, Swain. So all this is, is... You're going to give me an answer to the three questions that I ask you, essentially. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to get mindful in the moment, and I want you to tell me three things that you see currently. Cookies, uh, microphone, and water. Okay, good. Now I want you to tell me three things that you hear currently. Sports psychologist, Steve. All right, that's a good one. My stomach. Okay. Cars going by. Okay. Okay. It might be a little bit difficult when you have headphones on, right? But then the third one would be three things that you feel physically. So three things that you're physically feeling at the moment. My shirt is soft. Okay. And the headphones on my head and the uh, heater in my room. All right. And so that's the whole exercise. It's just identifying three things that you see, three things that you hear, and three things that you feel in the moment right now. And what that's designed to do is to get your mind focused back in on the moment that you're experiencing right now, as opposed to thinking about, again, previous past uh, successes or failures, or potentially any anxiety that might be coming up for a future competition. Okay. So it's, it's to just get you out of that, like, you know, thousand yard stare <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's some super good advice right there oh oh that's terrible. an easy one kind of, terrible yeah. both of legos you. chapstick memes <laughs> <laughs> i'm always looking at memes <laughs> and honestly um again where that came from was you've got a sniper he's out um, you know, in a hostile environment and he has to remain motionless for very extended periods of time. And so it's easy for your mind to start to wander in that particular instance. And so every once in a while, his spotter will remind him to remain mindful, stay in the moment. And they use this three by three exercise to make sure that they're ready if they need to potentially take a shot. You know, that's so awesome because one of the things I've been having issues with, and this could partially be solved if I just played less. But when you put in those like long sessions and especially with the trials ticket, obviously you want to do a trials ticket in one sitting, but that's seven to nine games. If you're depending on how many uh, boons you can buy and with the way games are different every game, 
I mean, you can steamroll a few and just feel good and get in the zone, but then a different team comes along and they're playing more passive or something like that. It's so easy for me to just slip out of it at like game six and just, you know, rush into the middle like I was the last game and forgetting that this three entirely different opponents. So that's a really great tool for just thinking like, okay, back to square one here. We are starting a game. It's the same map. I know that, but these are different people and I'm, you know, feeling it out for the first time again, as opposed to just kind of getting worn down by the long hours of a, of a few trials runs and stuff like that. So I'm definitely going to try to use that. Yeah. I'm always looking for uh, stuff like this to use with bones so that I can get him back on track. <laughs> it's necessary, man. I need, I need like focus bones, sorry, in my you, life. What do you see in your room? <laughs> Memes. <laughs> Memes. All your Twitch subscribers. Yeah. Just have a Moobot <laughs> command that says. Looking back on, on this episode and really all the people that we talked to, um, we got a lot of good advice, but I think it's, it's fair to give ourselves a little bit of credit. We are <laughs> not just exclusively, uh, uh, third-party advice brokers. No, we've got some advice of our own. And uh, I almost pulled a clip from myself uh, kind of talking about some of the revelations that I had. But uh, ultimately, this is uh, this is the one that I thought was a good fit because, Bonesy, you brought up this thing called OODA loops. Oh, yeah. And you really, you ran with it. T- tell me, tell me, set this one up a little bit. This this really is another one of those light bulb moments. Like I said at the beginning, like uh, or I've said before, I have I have multiple. You know, it wasn't I I didn't get good in one day. And this was when I was playing some other games, but really trying to enhance that decision making process where I'm like, okay, yeah, I can practice the mechanics all day. I've got a good shot, but what can I do to be better? And one thing I've always seen in good players is just how quickly they move and they think. And you can't move and do the right thing without making a good call. But there's this process that I discovered, and it's been used in the military. It's used in uh, any sort of like <laughs> time where you've got to make uh, strong decisions. But I discovered the OODA loop, which is observe, orient, decide, and act. And then I learned something that's been sort of my mantra for a long time since is that uh, a fast decision always beats a good but slow decision. And that was like, that was it for me. You know, I can take all the time in the world to review what might might happen to predict these players to know what they're going to do. Like I've, I've read them like a book. But if I don't do that quickly enough, it doesn't matter. So that the person using, you know, shotgun ape in quotes is going to win because you didn't make a decision fast enough. So when I when I figured that out, I started just doing things faster and trying to do that. And put it all in a loop like something really, really clicked for me. So this was a game changer. All right. This was from episode 120. Oodle loops and headspace. Feels so long ago. <laughs> I don't want to say we got some mail after this one, but we certainly got some like, huh? Go back and listen to this one. Listen <laughs> yeah. to this bit. Go back and listen to the whole episode. Do it. Oodle loop. Doesn't it? It's, it's like a cereal. Uh, yes. This is a concept created and used by the U.S. military. Uh, and and it's, it's an extreme <laughs> complex psychological <laughs> strategy. And if like you research it, you'll just be like, what? Like it's way too much, but we're going to slim it down way down to how it can apply to video games. Uh, and the basic concept here is think before you act. Duh. Right. Very simple. But there's a lot that goes on while you're doing that. And this little loop uh, really, really clarifies it and, it. and it describes, well, personally, how I, how I, need to play uh, to make up for my reaction times and stuff, but you'll see why. So I've been saying OODA loop, and that's an acronym, O-O-D-A, and it stands for observe, orient, decide, and act. And let's go through the four of those right away. Observe, that's taking in raw information, the stuff on your screen, supers on top of the screen, timer, score. Radar. Radar. Movement, something happens, literally bullets. I don't know. Taking in that information, absorbing it to later use. The second O is for orient. And that's when you modify the observations based on past knowledge or meta knowledge. 
and you're going to orient yourself around that information. So yeah, you can take in raw information. You know, there's five minutes left. Then you can take what you know and you know, okay, well, that means we've got to get this many kills to win or we've got to make a play here. Or I know that this gun is good. I'm using that, you know, meta decision stuff. That's, that's where you're orienting yourself around the game so that you're making uh, good decisions, which is the third one, decide. This is the literal act of, of, of taking action where you're deciding what action to take. Act, act, do it, execute your decision. So it flows very nicely, right? These steps sort of flow right into each other. And for good reason, because they're happening all the time, constantly, very quickly without really realizing it. So when I say observe, orient, decide, act, you know, you don't have time to set that up, right? You're not going like, all right, well, all right, maybe I'll shoot later once I've oriented myself and then I'll decide and then I act. This happens real, real fast. And so that's why it's easy to forget. Also, another thing is like most tips, most strategy, most discussion on video games that you get, you get information about like, or what's the meta right now, the top five guns in the crucible, uh, best hero to play in Overwatch. The, all those tips and all that talk revolves around the act, right? It's just the things that you do. Do this. You'll be better. And we do it all the time. A lot of our show focuses on the act. This loop that you're going to do really informs you how much more there is, how much stuff happens before you act. And that's the biggest part of it. So birds, you had mentioned uh, the, the, the concept of, uh, of kind of clearing your mind, just going with the flow, not thinking too hard. And there's the good part of that, right? Like being in flow is great. Then there's the bad mm-hmm. part, which is like autopilot. Yep. And I'm the super guilty mind. of that. I'm watching Atlanta on one screen and trying to play quick play on the other. I am in autopilot and I am not doing well uh, all the time. Monkey mind. That's a lot of uh, decision or an act with very little observation and orientation. You might do that. Basically, you know, you could see who has a super. You're not, you're not really reacting to it quickly and, and efficiently and making smart decisions. Uh, and that and so often I hear people talk about how, well, man, I put up great numbers in quick play and I don't do great in trials. It's like, well, the common response they get is like, well, matchmaking, put in quick play. It's like, whatever, but it's, you got to really come to play to win in in trials. Well, it's like that, but it's also this OODA loop thing really, really is required for trials and you don't utilize it that often in quick play. You don't have to observe and orient. You can just act and you'll do just fine doesn't work in trials. All right. So talk me through this thing. I'm going to, I'm going to load up the game and orient myself and then observe the game and then decide I'm going to play it. And then I'm going to play my match. That's it, right? (laughs) Well, no, it's more like micro loops that are happening constantly. This is stuff that's just it's why I say loop It's because it's literally on a loop and everything you're doing is just another loop and another loop. So this is happening all the time while you play. You look to your right, you take out the right gun, you shoot. There's that loop all right there. And that's happening for you. But also think about it's happening for every other player in that match. That means that in destiny PVP, there are eight OODA loops happening at all times. And that's important for you to know because because this game is not just about what you decide to do. It's the decisions of all of the other players, four opponents on the other team, your three teammates. All of those OODA loops are really crucial uh, for what you're doing. You know, you have to observe and orient yourself around those loops. So there's eight of them. And it's very complex. And in a perfect world, in, in, a, in a, a, a super genius computer mind, you'd be able to track all of these at the same time and you would be like the matrix and just, you know, perfectly <laughs> fighting all. like a 50 agent Smiths. But like, obviously that's crazy and you can't really do that uh, in, in a more realistic sense. High skill players, really good thinking players are managing multiple OODA loops. They're doing themselves. They are managing the OODA loop of their direct opponent. They might even be considering their teammates at the same time and the other opponents that they can't quite see. That's a lot. You see that with like someone that's like helping, uh, specifically, it reminds me of like Joey, like when he's teaching someone, he's like walking them through 
the OODA loop that they're supposed to be going through. Like, hey, come with me. You should be watching out over there and like talking them through what the steps are. And for him, it can be vocal. Yeah, and then there's a there's a, a big team component to the first uh, two spots, the observe especially, because you can give call outs. So you can sort of take care of that first step of your teammates' OODA loop by just giving that information. Here's some more raw information that you can orient around, and boom, you're you're like halfway through your own loop. But again, that's all happening very fast. These loops are constantly going. Uh, they're, they're, they're literally every single micro decision you make, where you run, where you look, where you scope, where you shoot. Uh, and, and that's, that's the thing is that beginner players really have their one loop going and it's already a lot to manage and you get outplayed because you're just not thinking beyond yourself. Like that out of body experience is not happening and you're not observing and judging your opponent before they hit you. So that, that whole autopilot that's what that is, right? You only have your own loop. You're running around. You're dying. You don't really see why. You haven't made any adjustments. But if you're focusing on those OODA loops, your own, maybe your opponents, you can start to go, oh, that guy starts out with a sticky throw. And then when he misses, he doesn't have a follow-up shot. Now I'm going to orient around that. I'm going to dodge that. Now that he threw his grenade and he doesn't know what to do, I'm going to go up and kill him. That's how you're reacting to an opponent's OODA loop. Now you're managing two. Now just think about eight and <laughs> slowly build up to that. <laughs> All right. So this thing is happening constantly and it happens very quickly and you're usually not even thinking about it. So with the power of podcast magic, Bonesy, here's what I want you to do. <laughs> uh, you're in trials. Mm -hmm. Maybe even a moment that happened recently. And the round has started Something's already happened. Maybe the first pick has happened. And think specifically. Find a moment, and we're going to freeze time. Andrew, freeze time sound effect now. All right. And we could say here in this one frozen moment for as long as we want, again, with the power of podcast magic, Bonesy, talk me through in detail. Observe, orient, decide, act. What's going through your head? Set the scene. Okay. Because this is about decision-making. I, I talked about this during a run a couple weekends ago on Eternity. So we're playing defense, and we check keyhole first. The other team did not go to keyhole. They went to temple. Now, there was one thing I kept trying to reinforce, and it was push through keyhole. Get there fast. Do something now because we have already confirmed. We have observed that the team is not here, we were a little cautious. We didn't want to walk out into lanes, but we did observe and confirm that there were no enemies on this side. They all went to temple. Now, then the Orient does take place, but it's just a little slow, right? We're like, okay, what does that mean? They're not on this side. I can choose to go forward. I can choose to swing around in the back. That decision happens a little slow sometime in trials. So then I decide as quickly as I can, once I've observed and oriented myself around that, to just keep going. My action is I am going to sprint forward, continue to push forward, and try to get a flank while the rest of my team either follows me through or swings back around and tries to do a pinch. That's the OODA loop right there. And that's just one. That is literally... So so in this freeze, unfreeze, it's only two seconds later, and I haven't made it to Temple. I haven't killed anyone. All I've done is really run forward to try to look down the hallway, right? That was my OODA loop right there. Observe that there was no one here. Orient myself, and then that means that they all went to Temple. Uh, the, it's been this long, so they're probably above power ammo at this point. Um, I've decided that I'm going to push through for the flank. I've acted, and now I'm sprinting forward to that spot. That's an OODA loop. All right, folks. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. This takes us through what we, uh, what we set out to, to kind of cover this week. Don't worry. Next week, we are getting into the nitty gritty. Like, you don't slide enough. Slide around more. It's a, it's a shooter. You got a slide button. Use it. It's a crouch button, but it's really a slide button. Um, but uh, we're going to cover all of that next week. You know, I wanted to cap this one off uh, with really the same thing we started with. Um, this is, of course... Our final clip, this is from uh, Sports Psych Steve. Come on. Um, he, he really recapped it. He, he captured that growth mindset, and uh, he did it in a real concise way. 
And if there's one takeaway from, from all of this, you know, you got to figure out all of this yourself, but it really starts from this point. Could you give us a quick recap of the difference between the fixed and the growth mindset? Yeah, sure. So when we're talking about the fixed and growth mindset, specifically to this particular performance, right? So playing the game of destiny. And you can have either a fixed or a growth mindset about several different characteristics about the game. So for example, um, having a growth mindset about failure is thinking about failure in a way that it is not necessarily permanent, it's something that can change um, and something that you can learn from. Uh, when you talk about challenges and obstacles, again, this is something where you feel like you have the ability to overcome these if you have the growth mindset. Uh, in addition, when it comes to effort, you feel like you will have some control over the outcome and the amount of effort that you put in will be associated with that success or failure. And then finally, one that we talked about was how success of others is viewed. And so are you threatened by that success, which would be that fixed mindset, or are you encouraged and inspired by that success of others? And can you learn something from them, learn from their feedback as well? So if you can really stick with that growth mindset, you will avoid um, those feelings of losing control and um potentially assigning the causality of your deaths and your losses and your low KD to things that are outside of your control. So for me, a lot of these uh, pieces of advice that we put out in this episode uh, got me where I am now, where I feel very comfortable in the crucible. It's been a, it's, I've come a long way from episode one. Uh, I think that anyone that kind of hits on all of these pieces of advice uh, can make those steps to uh, become a better player like I did. Yeah, you know, look, it doesn't happen overnight, right? You got to, you, you don't learn some of these ideas. You don't learn growth mindset by listening to a five minute clip on a podcast. You got to, you got to dust these ideas off. You got to, you got to think about it. Basically, what I'm saying is download this episode over and over and over again <laughs> until you really feel uh, once per week, or I'd say. Until you the, feel like you really need some HelloFresh. You really need some HelloFresh. I, I would say once per week, four in eight week period, I think, is uh, the right amount of time to really get your head wrapped. But honestly, like, yeah, these are, you know, the, these are these are the fundamentals, right? They, and they don't really change. If you're having a rough time, you feel like you're not landing your shots or you should have won that one, but you didn't. Um, you know, it's, it's not rocket science. You just come back to these things and um, go watch your gameplay. And we do have even more to discuss in part two, where we really dive in to the mechanics of destiny and how you can really hone your first person shooter skills. But like, it's true guys, we did it. We set out to get better and we all got better. Even if our starting points were different, I know I, I improved. I've seen you guys improve by playing with and against you the whole time. And 100%, my brain is in a better place after doing this show for this long and having these conversations because I look at stuff with that growth mindset more often now. And I'm just like, I'm open to trying new things. and I'm really open to understanding my own limits or where I need improvement. It's awesome. So that's that's never going to get old. So that's it. That's part one of all you'll ever need to know to get good, or at least a big chunk of what you can use. Uh, next week, we're going to talk mechanics, getting in there, playing the game itself, what you should be doing with your hands on a controller, on a keyboard, on a mouse, all those things. But the first step is getting your mind right and being in the right headspace. That's it. Folks, I hope you enjoyed it. If uh, you want to check out all of these episodes and uh, listen back, uh, go to crucibleradio.com uh, or, you know, open up your podcast app. It's all in there. It's it's pretty straightforward. And because this would be real messy in the show notes on iTunes or whatever, uh, I will try to post either birds or I will post a comment on the Reddit thread where you can find all of these episodes specifically. Uh, so if you're listening along and you're going like, wait, what, what episode was Keen on? Uh, we'll we'll post that info and, and what we <laughs> what we tripped from, uh, but yeah, it won't show up on Spotify. That'd be some real bad formatting. Yeah, so it's uh, reddit.com slash crucible playbook. Of course, if you like what it is that we do and you want just uh, you you want to hear us talk a bit more, apparently people seem to like that. Um, and talk about all the other uh, the other stuff in life. Get a little peek behind the curtain. 
uh, feel free, go to support us. Patreon.com slash Crucible Radio. We put out a bonus podcast twice a month. It is a buck an episode uh, or not. Thanks for listening no matter what. All right, we'll be back next week with some uh, mechanical advice. Till then. Bye. Bye. What's up, everyone? Bones here. Do you like podcasts? Do you like chill conversation? Well, me and my co-host Swain and Birds put out a bonus podcast every month on Patreon. If you want to check it out and be a part of more awesome stuff, head over to patreon.com slash crucible radio and join the squad. See you there.